So in this great series, in this great series called Relationships, last Sunday I started something that I hoped I would finish, but I did not get it done. I did not get it done, and the sermon title last Sunday was The Fabulous Five. We showed you, we showed you a couple of videos that said you become like the top five people you spend the most time around. You literally become them. You start thinking like them. You react to life the way they react to life. They end up shaping you. Uh, a, a man told me years ago when my son was small, his name, Winston Lee, he said, let me help you understand, Pastor. I hear Josh is getting his license. I said, yes, sir, he's getting his license. He said, let me tell you how it works. He said, when your son is in the car, you got a whole boy. You got a whole boy. When one of his good friends is in the car with him, you got half a boy. If two of his friends are in the car with him, you ain't got no boy at all. Because two... If they want to do something different, your son will end up doing what they want to do unless he's very strong. So in other words, you and I become who we are around. So we were challenging you last Sunday. Thanks for coming again this Sunday because last Sunday people were like, oh, my God, Pastor, that was rough. Well, bless his name. If you did not have many names on your list, I'm going to go over the first part again so you can start writing these names down. And here's the only question that matters in the kingdom. When the Bible says repent, repent for the kingdom of heaven is coming. This is what it literally means. Your life is a life of destiny. The kingdom of heaven is here. Your life is a life of destiny. It's a life of power. And God's getting ready to do something in your life. So you got to figure out how the kingdom works. And the kingdom works by relationships of people that God puts in your life. And you've got to determine who the right people are and who the wrong people are. You've got to go through this process of determining who should I allow to talk to me. At the end of the day, you have to decide Who am I going to listen to at critical times? During critical times, who's going to be shaping me? So we said you need five five types of relationships in your life, remember? Five types of relationships. Five types. Have Have your friends, you might have people you hang out with or whatever, but you need these five types in your life. Y'all ready? What are they? You took notes last Sunday. What are they? It's a faith builder. A form shaper, a fitness coach, (laughs) financial mentor. Someone asked me, "Uh, Pastor, are you done with the fitness coach part? I said, no, I'm coming back to that. They said, well, I might not be at church when you talk about fitness. People think you're going to talk about exercise and eating right before Thanksgiving or Christmas. And we might. But it's really not about exercise and eating. It's about are you fit and prepared for your future? Are you ready for it? And there's going to be some people in your life that's going to make sure you're in shape for what's coming next. Hmm. You need a financial mentor. You need someone in your life that has permission to know how much you make. Know how much you're saving if you're investing correctly. And then number five... You need a family model. You need these five relationships in your life, and you need to be intentional. Write it down. I need to be intentional about this. I need to be intentional. This is not going to happen by the Holy Ghost or by the Spirit of the Lord necessarily. You're going to have to use wisdom as you form these type of relationships. And they may graduate over time. They may graduate. They may escalate. You may find a different type of person to help you, right? So that's no problem. So now, we talked about a faith builder, and I put questions I put questions in front of these because these are the questions you get. If you're in someone's life and you're trying to help them build their faith, they might say, they might say to you, what I believe is none of your business. What I believe is none of your concern. What I believe about God, eternity, the devil, or, or faith, or the Bible, or church, none of this is your business, Right? But the real question is, whose business is it then? 
If it's not my business, if, if, if it's not, if, if, I, if I say to an important relationship around me, my wife asks me, so what are we going to do with our budget this year? And I'm like, that's none of your business. And she would ask me, then whose business is it if it's not mine? <laughs> because she would want to know, who are you listening to when it comes to your faith? Say it with me. Weird people makes you build a weird faith. Let me, let me, let me tell you what I mean. Let me tell you what I mean. What you believe is important. What you believe about God is important. What you believe about people is important. But especially what you believe about yourself is important. So you need someone in your life to make sure your beliefs aren't screwed up. Life happens to us. There are bad people in the world who don't know who they are. And they take advantage of us. Then we start building belief systems on what happened. Or who did something or who didn't do something. We start building belief systems and structure and infrastructure around that. Then we start making decisions on that. You need somebody in your life that will ask you, what are you doing? You're not obeying God because somebody you love told you you couldn't? Somebody hurt you and now you're giving up on God? You need a faith person in your life that says that's not how it's done. You've got to give somebody permission to do that, though. Because the, what do they say? I'm going to give you some constructive criticism. Do you know the definition of constructive criticism? What is constructive criticism? I made a C minus in this class, and it's the only thing I learned from it. The class called Abnormal Psych. Anybody take Abnormal Psych in college? I still have headaches when I think about it. The class made absolutely no sense at all. Abnormal Psych says, what was I going to tell you? Abnormal Psych says, constructive criticism only works when you've given somebody permission to give you instruction. If I haven't given you permission to criticize me, it's not constructive. If I haven't told you, I want you to tell me how this went, then you can tell me. But if you just walk up to me and say, you know what, Martin, that was a horrible sermon today. Your scriptures are wrong. I don't believe the Bible says that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be like to you, wow, that is interesting, is what I say. That is really interesting. Or I'll say, that's fascinating. And then I will go to lunch. (laughs) I won't think about it again. I won't mention it again. But if one of the leaders, one of the elders, my wife, someone walks up to me and says, you know, Pastor Martin, I'm concerned about your sermon today. These are people I've given permission to talk back to me. And instead of saying, that's interesting, that's fascinating, I'll say, tell me what you heard. (laughs) Because I've opened my life up to them to talk to me. I'm still on faith building. So a faith builder is this. A faith builder helps you build and strengthen your relationship with God through your faith. They're going to make sure you're using your faith all the time. They're not going to allow you to look at life and let life make your decisions. They're going to make sure you're operating by faith. They're not going to let you operate by fear. They're going to train you to overcome your fear. So now, I gave you a bunch of scriptures on that. I don't want to do that. You need a form shaper. A form shaper is a person that has a sense of your greatness. Write it down. A form shaper is a person that has a sense of your greatness. Now, you may not have a sense of your great, great, greatness yet. I can tell y'all are here. Y'all with me, right? You may not have a sense of how great you are, but a form shaper is going to have a sense of your power, your calling, your purpose, your anointing. They're going to have a sense of that, and they're going to drive you into that greatness. Form shapers are difficult to deal with because they don't really care about you. They don't really care about how you feel. They don't really care about how you like them or love them. They're there to shape what they see in you. 
And if there's something wrong going on inside you, you always leave your form shapers. You run away from your form shapers. Because that form... Is that thunder? Bless the name of Jesus. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 the form shaper, excuse me. The, the form shaper sees who you're supposed to be. So they keep putting pressure on you to become that. Well, they don't like me. Someone said to me, I just feel like you don't like me. And I said, I don't. <laughs> That's not my job as a form shaper. I don't like you, but I like the person you're getting ready to be. <laughs> That's what we're working on. We're working on who you're supposed to be. We're working on the dream in your heart. We're working on calling. We're working on purpose. Because you are, say it, I'm always greater than it looks right now. Every time, all the time. You are so much bigger than what you've experienced. You're bigger than your mistakes. You're bigger than other people have thought about you. And you're bigger than what you've gone through. Always. And you need somebody in your life that'll tell you that. You ever had a friend that really believed in you? And you fussed them out, cussed them out, kicked them out, unfriended, unloved, unliked them. And the next week they showed up like, what we doing? And you'd be like, didn't I get rid of you? <laughs> no, because a form shaper is not moved by what you think you're, you're moving them out of your life. They're committed to your end. Am I making sense? I'm a form shaper, so I'm a father. And I'm a husband. I'm committed, number one, to forming and shaping the people in my house. Committed to it till I die. And I say to all of them, I don't care what happens to you out there. Just make it home. So I can remind you of who you really are. When you get in trouble and if you get in trouble, call me first. Don't call the lawyer. Don't call the police. Call me. I'm the form shaper. What am I going to do? I'm going to stand between you and those who don't know you. Don't understand your calling. Don't understand your anointing. You might not be anointed now, but there's an anointing on you. So you call me first so I can step right in there. Said, so, no, I'm not going to let you destroy this child's life. Because I know where he's headed. My daughter may be going through a lot of junk right now. But as a father, I'm standing right here in front of her. Between her and the ignorant. Come on, men. Say that's what daddies do. Shoot, I'm not afraid to be a dad. I'm not concerned about what my kids go through. I'm not concerned about what they struggle with. I'm a father. I know who they're going to become. So my job is to stand right here. Hell, hot water, discouragement, prison, Poverty, whatever it looks like, you're going to find me standing right here. And don't mess with yourself either. That little girl over there that lifts her hands all the time, she is ruthless. When it comes to her family and her children, she is not saved or sanctified. We got forms to shape, men. Oh, wow, I'm getting into February now. We got forms to shape men in our homes. We got wives and children in our homes. Maybe children outside our homes, in other cities. We're responsible for shaping their life. We're responsible for, for standing in the presence of God for them. We're responsible for protecting, for protecting our women. Met a man who gave up on his daughter. I'm like, I want to understand what you're telling me. I just gave up on her. I said, you mean you gave her to the Lord? No, I just gave up on her. I said, you fool. I mean, you, 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 are, you are the epitome of ignorance. Can I fuss just a little bit? I said, how are you going to give up on your daughter? She 
She's got to come to you to find out who she is. My daughter came home from law school. I mean, she's 22. Get ready to be 23. 23. She is 23. Yes. <laughs> Ran in the house out of her car. And, and uh, when I came home, I didn't know where she was. So I'm calling and saying, hey, how you doing? So I sat down, you know, to answer some emails. She runs downstairs and hops in my lap. In my lap. Now I got a choice to make. I can finish my emails or I can make sure my daughter gets her cuddle time with me so she don't have to look for Alfred. You know, this is what I'm saying. This is what I'm saying, Marvin. I, there are some things in my life I don't want nobody to take my place. Okay, okay. I don't, I, don't want, I don't want them, I don't want my wife to have to go somewhere else for comfort. I don't want my children to have to look for a man or a woman that will just say, I love you and rub their face. I'm the form shaper. And I'm a two-sided coin. Y'all, I'm going to move on. I know I got three to go. <laughs> two-sided coin. I get it. I, I get it all my life. Uh, there's really not going to be a whole lot of in-between when it comes to some of y'all. Can I, can I talk to you? There ain't going to be no in-between. You're going to be a two-sided coin. People are going to love you because you're shaping them. Or they're going to hate you because you're shaping them. Don't mess that up. Don't try to be loved by everybody. But whatever you do, don't stop what you do. If you're a shaper, if you're making sure people know who they are, just keep doing that. And God will always have somebody in your life to shape. I'm going to stand up here and say this because... I'm going to stand up here and say this because it, it begins to get me. It begins to get me because... because it, there's so much in this world. There's so much that we fight. So much that we fight mentally and emotionally in our hearts because people wander in and out of our lives and don't know what to do with us, don't know how to take us, can't discern what real love is and what real concern is. So there's this wrestling match inside you. If I can this morning, I just want you to be at peace. Be at peace at who you are, what you do in people's lives. And as you begin to appreciate yourself, God will bring more people in your life to do what you do with them. Tell your neighbor, you got to love yourself first. Number three. What do you need? You need a fitness coach. Now watch this. I'm just going to read this, all right? I'm just, I'm just going to read it. That's all we're going to do. This fitness coach, when a fitness coach comes into your life, you'll say words like, I don't have to talk to you about my life. It's, it's none of your business whether I'm in shape or not. That's personal. How are you doing emotionally? <clears throat> that ain't none of your business. <laughs> When's the last time you went to the gym? That is definitely none of your business. <laughs> what I eat has nothing to do with you. My mental health, my psychological health means nothing to you. It's none of your business. You ask your children, how are you doing? And they say, I'm doing good. That means they got a friend at school they feel more comfortable talking to than to you. Don't allow that in your home. Break down whatever wall that is between you and your children so that they come to you first, especially when they think they're failing or they're dirty. You want them to come to you first. Well, I'm not my children's friend. I'm here to discipline them. You can't discipline what you can't see.
So they have to be in a position. I feel so good during this sermon. I hope it's not just me. Are we okay? It's, 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 it's this open door for people to be who they are around you so that you can find out how are you doing? How are you doing in your life? Okay, so now the fitness coach, this is what a fitness coach does. Basically, a fitness coach ensures planning and preparation for your physical, emotional, and psychological health so that you can be prepared and you can endure what's coming next. They make sure you're in shape just in case the starting quarterback gets hurt. If you're not in shape for opportunities that you don't know are coming, you will flop in the game. People say, pray for me, pastor. I want, I want a raise on my job. I said, are you serious about a raise? Well, I want a management position. Are you, are you sure? I want to start a business. Are you sure this is what you want? Because if you ask me to pray for you about an upgrade, I'm not going to pray for the upgrade. I want a raise. I want a better job. Lord, shape this man's mind. Deal with his idiosyncrasies. Cause him to read the right books. Tell him to get the right mentor. Make his heart hard so when people criticize him, he knows how to take it. About that time, their arms start coming down. <laughs> Thank you. Because a raise requalify, I mean, a raise is built on how you can deal with people. I want a raise. People don't understand that. You want to go from $50,000 to $100,000, that's going to mean managing people. And you ain't never managed people. You manage paper. People ain't paper. You know people come to work weird. Or they don't come at all. <laughs> Lord, give me a promotion. Give me a promotion in the Army, Air Force, uh, Marines. Give me a promotion. No, you got to understand. You're going, from, you're going from E4 to E5. You're getting ready to manage some people. And these people have all sort of thoughts. Some of them are getting over. Some of them are just counting their time. Some of them want you to do their job. So your real work, if you listen to me, if you want to raise, you got to raise yourself. Do you know what it's like to handle a $3 million budget? Do you know what aptitude that takes? No, you don't. No, you don't. I'm going to stay right here because y'all saints, y'all pray for stuff. Y'all pray for stuff, and you ain't in shape for it. I'm going to get in the ring with Mike Tyson. The question is, the question is not, are you going to get in the ring? The question is, how long are you going to last in the ring? So people get what they pray for and come back to church mad. Then people don't like me at work. Well, what happened? You got a raise. <laughs> You've been working 20 years by yourself looking at paper. Now you're managing 25 staff. It's not that they don't like you. They don't like any boss. It ain't you. They don't like, they don't like any boss. Because everybody working don't want to work, including me. I never wanted a job. So even when I went to work, I didn't <laughs> want to go to work. But I had bosses. It's not you they don't like. It's the you that's not prepared to lead them they don't like. When you're leading people, you got to learn how to do that work before they do it. So that you can tell them what you want them to do, train them on what you want them to do, and come back and judge if they did it or not. You just wanted the extra bing bings in your, uh, in your account. You just wanted some more money in that automatic deposit. <laughs> and now, before you weren't bringing your job home, but now you're bringing your job home, telling your wife and your kids and your husband, I just don't like this job. No, you asked for this job. It ain't their burden. You asked for the job, you got your extra money, 
Now we got to find some extra leadership in you. I want to start on the football team. You only at the gym when you only at the gym when the team is there. If you're gonna start on this team, you gotta do something extra without anybody telling you to do it. I should give you a scripture though, shouldn't I? Y'all want a scripture? Lord Jesus. First Timothy 4. 12. Y'all love me? Mean it now. Don't be playing. Watch this. No, no, no. That's not what I want. Thank you back there. 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Listen, listen, listen to what. These are the instructions Paul is giving to his young disciple. He says, I want to talk to you. Because, t- because he'd given Paul permission to talk to him. You with me? Listen to what he says. Flee. Flee sexual immorality. Run from it. You hear what I'm saying, sugar? You hear what I'm saying? You do? You do? Uncross your arms. There you go. It, it means you're listening to me. Yeah, when you cross your arms, I'm, I get concerned. Okay, this is what it says. It says run from sexual immorality. Every, every other sin a man does is outside his body. Watch this now. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his body. Watch this now. So what did you say? So or do not, do, don't you know, here's the point I want to make. Do you not understand that your body is the only reason you have purpose. Okay, okay, I'm going to come to this side. Do I need to come in the middle? Y'all seasoned saints in the middle, though, ain't you? (laughs) Y'all Lord lovers in the the middle, ain't you? I come over here, I feel piety. (laughs) Okay, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is whom you have from God, and you are. For you have been bought, therefore. So what he's saying is, we're not just talking about sex out of wedlock or adultery. That's not the point. The point here is, your body has the Holy Ghost in it. And without your body, the Holy Ghost can't live in something. And you cannot fulfill your purpose if you're dead. So there are some things you don't eat. Not because it's, it's, well, that's religious. You can't tell me what to eat. Who can? Who can tell you what to eat? Well, nobody, pastor. I get it. It's fine. Who can tell you where not to go? Who can tell you, boy, keep your zipper up with that girl? (laughs) Mamas. (laughs) Sweetheart. He's cunning. I can feel it, sweetheart, when he's around you. I see it. If you open your heart to him, he's going to mess you up. Who can tell you that? Y'all looking at me like, nobody, pastor. I follow my heart. Your heart. Your heart will lead you. Bruh. Your nose, when you, I mean, Bob told me about when he met you. When Bob met Princess Diane, he said, this woman is going to mess me up, but I got to have her. He said, I got to have her. I got to do what I got to do. Whatever I got to do, I have to have this woman. 
So he did what he had to do to get her. Any men in here, clear your throat. <clears throat> yeah, pastor, I had me one of them. Just had to have her. I just had to have him, pastor. There was something going on. There was something going on in my life where I had to have them. And it works out beautifully when it's God. But you have to make sure your heart is in the right condition. Okay, let me move on. Uh, this, is what, this is what I'm going to say, I think. Ooh, that's so good. I'm going to skip that, though. Ooh. Okay, okay, Proverbs 4.23. Y'all okay? Are you serious? This is from the Passion Translation, uh, Proverbs 4.23. Uh, who can tell you this right here? Read it out loud. R read, read, read it with me. Read it out loud. So, above all, do what? Guard the affections of your heart. Come on. For they affect all that you are. Come on. Pay attention to the... Welfare of your, why? For, f tell somebody next to you, get your mind right. Make sure your mind is right. <laughs> Guard your mind. Guard your thinking. Guard your affections. Guard your emotions. Who in your life can tell you, I don't, I don't think that's going to work out. Who can tell you in your life, you need to see a counselor? Uh-uh, I'm saved. I'm a Christian. I don't need no counselor. <laughs> I don't need nobody telling me no psycho babble. I don't, need, I don't need a pharmacist. I don't need no, no drugs. I don't need no drugs, no drugs. I don't need none of that. I'm good. I'm a saint of God. That is the number one side. They have mental problems. <laughs> when they don't need to talk to nobody, listen to me. Listen to me, please. I'm laughing, but if you got a person in your life close, Close now. Now, I know Dr. Earl got 25 doctorate degrees, but I'm going to mess with him. You got a person in your life that got 25 doctorate degrees and been counseling for close to 50 years, and they don't need nobody? Get your hat <laughs> and your coat and run because they just became God. And now when they talk to you, <laughs> when they talk to you, they're your friend before they get a degree. Hey, what's up? Dapping up the whole thing. Now they're like, so how are you doing? You know, what's your diagnosis? Well, hold on. We just watching a ball game. That's all we doing. <laughs> That's not what we doing. We, we just friends. What's the diagnosis? And start using all the stuff. My first question is, y'all don't know. Guess what my first question is? It's not how are you? Guess, if you're a psychiatrist, I want to know, who is your psychiatrist? If you're a counselor, before you touch my head, I want to know, who's your counselor? If you're a mechanic, who fixes your car? I do. Can't bring my car to you. Don't ever take your car <laughs> to a man who fixes his own car. There's stuff on his car. Okay, go to his car. Don't drive it. Turn the ignition on. And watch the lights that come up on the dashboard. <laughs> the brakes that need to be repaired. <laughs> the fluid that needs changing. 
That's why you have to be careful. Y'all really listening to me. That's why you have to be careful at who you allow to touch your soul. At the airport, I tell guys, can I shine your shoe? I said, if you had on shoes that could be shined, I'll let you shine. Okay. You wearing tennis shoes wanting to shine my shoe. It's 30% more for you to shine my shoe than take it to my cobbler. Why should I let you shine my shoe in the airport and you got on gym shoes? How are you going to tell me how to invest a million dollars when you haven't, you don't tithe? Tell your neighbor, guard your heart. Woo, Jesus. Guard your heart. Y'all still love me? Let me come over here. Let me, come, let me come over here to y'all. So. So. Do you trust your affections? Can you trust what you feel all the time? You can't? I agree with you. Write down the person you could go and talk to immediately about what you feel. Who could you go to? Don't write down mom or dad yet or spouse yet. Who else do you have in your life that once you're feeling something and you can't tell if it's good or bad, who could you go to? I'm blessed to have several people in my life starting with my wife, I can go to. That feeling is so assuring. (laughs) Who is that for you? It's getting quiet in here, but it needs to. You need this person. You need him in your life. Number four, can I move on from fitness? Are you in shape for what's next? Hmm? Are you in shape for what's next? Mentally, emotionally, spiritually, are you in shape for it? That's not rhetorical. I want you to answer me up in this church. Are you in shape for it? I want to know where I'm at. Just shake your head. Are you in shape for it? Let me tell you what's happening in your mind. In your mind right now, you know what God has for you. You can taste it, feel it. You dream about it every day. It never leaves your mind. But now there's a contradiction in your mind. Because I asked you a question. Are you in shape for that? And in your mind, you're saying, I'm not sure or no. I'm not in shape for that. Huh? That's why this church exists. That's the only reason this church exists. To build a family among people who are all trying to be champions. If you're not really interested in being a champion, stay. So we can put that in your heart. (laughs) Stay until your dreams are recovered. Find someone who believes in you enough to help you work through this process. That's why we're here. That's our unique calling in this city and in this world. Because you're always bigger than you think you are. And sometimes around here, you're going to be Miyagi'd. Just wax. Wax on, wax off. I'm tired of wax on. This makes, I'm not learning anything. I'll never be able to use this. Never be able to use this. Paint, that's all you're doing. This doesn't make sense. Why? Why are you asking me to serve? Why are you asking me to tithe? Why are you asking me to do all this stuff? Because we're, conf- we're confronting the stuff in you you don't know we're confronting. And before you know it, you're going to go and try to do something, and an enemy is going to show up. You're just going to be standing there when it shows up, and you're going to go, ah! 
How did that happen? You've been Miyagi all the time. And don't stop when you get there, because this church is going to get you there. But don't stop when you get there. Stay here so you can help somebody else get there. Two more. Fifteen minutes. You need a financial mentor. Financial mentor. And now this financial mentor, when people start talking about your money, you really get, I mean, you, your, your, your health and your weight is one thing. But when people start talking about your money, you close up like a clam. It's my money. It is none of your business. <laughs> it is none of your business. A friend said to me once, why are you working here? I was working, I was working over Christmas at a, in grad school at a, a place where they, uh, it, was a, it was a drugstore, but they also had toys there. I forget the name of it in Hattiesburg. It was when the Cabbage Patch doll came out. So he came in and he wanted a Cabbage Patch doll. He said, I heard you worked here. I said, yeah, I work here. He said, I said, there's no more Cabbage Patch on the floor. He said, I know they're not in on the floor. That's why I came to see you. There's got to be some back there. And I said, Doc, I can't, you know, that's not the way this works. I can't, I can't do that. The manager says they're on the shelf. We can't put them out to, you know, till they're ready. He was a real friend. So he honored that. I said, I can't do that. I need this job for a month. Got bills to pay. Just over Christmas break. So he said, by the way, why are you working here anyway? Why are you here? I said, to make money, I got bills to pay. He said, there was an internship available on campus in your major. Why didn't you take it? I said, it didn't pay anything. I need the money. He said, come here. I said, dude, I'm at work. <laughs> He said, come here. He said, there's an internship on campus in your major that'll put you so far ahead if you go do that instead of working here, guarding the Cabbage Patch dolls. <laughs> he just happened to be an upperclassman in, in doctoral school that I respected. So I left the job. I went back to campus and I told Dr. Bumgardner, I'm sorry, I know I'm a week late, but I'd like to take that internship for the Christmas break. He said, okay, fine. He held it open for me. He was the guy that made sure I got my master's degree at the end when it was iffy. Yeah. He said, you don't have to do these other classes. You don't have to do these other classes. You got a 3.8 average. You, I just, just go ahead and graduate. Go ahead and march. It's fine. Do you think I said, uh-uh, I got to take them classes? <laughs> I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> A financial mentor is going to tell you. They're not going to ask you. A financial mentor is going to tell you how to build your financial world and preserve it for the future generations. They're not going to ask you. They're going to tell you how. This is how you build your money. This is what you do with money. This is how you write a will. This is how you build a trust. This is how you invest. Don't invest with them. My financial mentor said, I said, there's a lot going on with, with penny stock. He said, only idiots invest in penny stock. I'm like, well, hold on. A lot of my friends are doing it. He says, are they broke? I said, yes, sir. He said, why are you listening to them? Are you an idiot or are they idiots? I said, why do we have to use such strong language? Because, because Martin, it's the only language you'll hear. I, I, I'm, I don't mean to be deep, y'all, but I might be saving your life or your marriage. People who love one another get married and a week later, they're in their own apartment. And the MUD bill comes. And all the other bills come. And there is no money to pay these bills. Sex gets old quick when you're not happy. But you don't have any money. Nobody's prepared for this life. So someone's got to tell you how to manage your money. Okay. 
I know, it's enough. It's enough, it's enough. I hear it, I hear it. Here's the proverb I'll give you. I think I'll just give you one. Just one proverb. One proverb in 24th chapter, 27th verse. It's amazing. This proverb is amazing. You, you're going to blow, this proverb is so deep, it's going to blow your mind when you read it. You ready to get your mind blown? Okay, put it up there. Read it. Put your... Solomon is like, this is what my daddy taught me. Get your outside work ready. Number one, find out what you're good at and what you do outside. What's your real gift? How are you going to really make money? Then prepare your field in which you do that work. Then build your house. AWC, any other church in the world can be behind on this. Y'all can't be behind. Please shake your neighbor. Shake your neighbor. Say, don't be behind now. Don't be embarrassing my pastor. Like you don't know what we talk about up in this church. You don't have turkey and everything. Now let me feed you. Listen to me. I care about you. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Doc. Figure out what your outdoor work is. Figure out what you're good at, your anointing, your power center. Then prepare the field in which you do it. I'm gifted at speaking, perhaps. But what field could I use speaking? I could do it in church. I could do it in motivational speaking. I could do it in the corporation. I could use it anywhere as a coach, which was my intent. I prepare my field. Then I build my house. I never build my house before I know what my work is. Because I'm going to end up building a million dollar house with a hundred thousand dollar field. Who can tell you that? Who in your life can say, don't buy that house? That's the wrong house. But the Lord, L A W D, told me. This was the house. When did he tell you that was the house? The house we live in now, we walked into that house three years before we bought it. It was for sale. And the Lord said to me, this is your house. I did not go to the bank and try to borrow $1.2 million that day. Because I had a $150,000 budget for a house. I didn't go there looking for no miracle or to beg nobody or to buy something that we will have to live in there without furniture and heat. <laughs> but did he say it was my house? He did. That's your house. I started to have to turn myself into the house. What's your field? Martin, what can you do? Oh, I can talk a little bit. Well, you talking, but you ain't got no books. You ain't got no YouTube channel. You ain't got nothing to sell. Nobody's inviting you anywhere. You're not getting any honorariums. How are you going to change yourself into that? I said, oh, I get invited all the time. I called my mentor. He said, boy, what is wrong with you? You get invited to people. And then he said, he got so upset with me. He said, just listen to Linnell. <laughs> just listen to Linnell. I said, I've been listening to it. He said, no, nah, you ain't listening to her. What did she say? I said, I'm not sure. He said, go back and ask her. I went back and asked. I said, what am I supposed to do? She said, let's write a book together. I said, okay. So we wrote a book together. She said, now let me sell the book. I'll promote it. Oh, okay, promote it. She said, if anybody invites you, send them through me. Because I would just go places. Hey, would you come over here and preach for us? People in church are weird. They'll invite you. They'll invite you to preach. We're going to reimburse you your plane ticket. This is what they say. We got a hotel room for you. Y'all ain't, ain't messing with me. I ain't worried about y'all this morning. You get there. You find out you got to get your own hotel room because the hotel room they got for you is a motel where when you walk in, you got white socks on. By the time you walk barefoot, 
to the front door to the bathroom, they dirty. I can't put my wife in a place like that. So now I got to go get another hotel once they drop me off. They don't reimburse you for your, your, your plane ticket. They drop you off at the hotel and don't feed you. And your motel ain't nowhere near a restaurante. And they're just some food we don't eat. Well, y'all bougie. No, we want to live till 120. Call it bougie, call whatever you want. Don't eat with me. Don't be walking by my table looking at what I mean. Oh, he bougie. Ignore ignorant people who are sucking down cheap plastic as their food. I'm going to come over here. <laughs> they were like. When I started listening to her. I got my first $10,000 honorarium. It was amazing. Hold up. Hold up. Let me, let, me, let me see what you just did so I can figure it out in my mind. You invited me. Let me pick my first class tickets for me and my wife. You put us in the best hotel, a suite. Then you honored us by giving us a driver for the whole weekend in a nice car, nice. <laughs> then you gave me $10,000 for 45 minutes? Nice. Listen, tell them around you, bro. So stop being jealous. Stop being jealous. Because see, here's the deal. Some of you in this room right now you have a $30,000 or $50,000 per hour gift in you. It's inside you and it's dormant. There are days for you, my brother, where there won't be any splinters in your hands. Your hands will no longer be working. Your mind and your money will be working for you. There are days there won't be any thorns from rose bushes in your fingers. Because that, sir, is the will of God. And I'm going to stand here till I die, and I'm going to preach it all the time to you. I'm going to keep, well, I hit my head against something, Pastor, didn't work out. What does that have to do with you? What does that have to do with you when something fails? What does that have to do with you? It has nothing to do with you. It failed. You didn't. It didn't work out. You still working. You're still here with promise and potential. That's all that matters. Well, I'm just going to give up now. We ain't going to let you give up. You can't give up. You give up on you. You're giving up on us. You're giving up on your... There are too many people relying on you not to give up. You got sons and daughters that are looking at you. And they're going to shape their life. By you talking about you give up. Well, a man said to me, a man said to me, well, I'm a felon. In this country, I can't get a child. I said, that's in your head. That's in your head. You don't have any limitations in this country unless you let somebody give you one. You are unlimited in nature, unlimited in power, unlimited in anointing. You can do whatever is in your heart. So I shook him and I said, then start a company. Start a company. If nobody will let you work for them, start a company and hire people. But you shout it, I'm never limited. Shake somebody and tell, if you give up, 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 you, I'm going to hit you with a shoe. I'm going to knock you stone out if you quit. Anybody else can quit, but I'm going to slap you in your face if you give up. Tell somebody, I'm coming to see you. I'm coming to see you if you start backing up. If you start walking away, I'm coming to see your behind. 
I'm telling you, men, some of y'all need to go ahead and get married to that girl. You need to go and tell that girl, listen, we got to tie this thing up. We got to lock this down. Because you're giving up too much. You need a woman in your life that will shake your rusty tail every now and then. Grab you by your ears and say, boy, you can't give up. You married to me. That's not how we do things around here. I'm not leaving and you ain't leaving. We getting ready to work this thing out. Well, I'm, working for, I'm waiting for the perfect girl. She don't exist till you shape her. Tell Albert to wake up. And Rooster and Kenny. Wake them up right now. The girl you're looking for, you got to build her. So you got to look for a woman that's pliable. She got all the good stuff. She got all the good stuff. She just need a man in her life that'll believe in her. Help shoulder, help mold her mind, help bring her body together, help her understand, girl, there ain't nobody in this world like you. My wife says, I'm getting ready to take this job. It's a trip, it's triple what I'm paying now, what I'm paying now. I oversee five people, they want me to oversee 120. I looked at her and said, come here, girl. I said, come here to daddy. I said, you're bigger than everybody. You're even bigger than me. Your head is so big. You can think outside the box. You can lead more people than me. I said, you're going to make more money than me. I said, just get on out there. If you need me, call me. (laughs) If you're in a board meeting, I'll show up at the board meeting. Out in the lobby, walk in the hallway. Yeah, girl, go and do your thing. She bring that big bonus home, and I say, you is the woman. Yes. You not mad at her because she makes more? Who is you crazy or am I crazy? Let that girl do what she do. I got five minutes. Y'all sit down. Is there a man in the house? You got a good woman. You got a, I mean, you got a good one. I mean, you, I mean, you shown up down in your soul. You know God messed you up with this woman. Look at that girl. If she's not here, when you get home, you tell her, girl, do what you do. I ain't going to leave y'all out. Sit down, brothers. Is there a woman in the house? You know you got a good man. You know you got a good man. You know you got a good man. You know you, you know, you, you know you got a good man. You know you got a good man. You know you got a good man. You ought to look at your husband and say, baby, there ain't nobody like you. Ain't nobody like you nowhere. Talk to me, Linnell. Talk to me. Talk to me. Talk to me. Talk to me. I can't allow nobody else to talk to me like that. And sometimes I'll say to my wife, I need you to talk to me. I need you to tell me that I'm a good man. I need you to tell me that I'm worthy of a gift like you. I need you to tell me I'm a good father. Because if I go outside of that to look for compliments, I'm in trouble. Well, I don't need my wife to feel good about me. You is a, you, are, you, you, sir, <laughs> you are lost in the woods. You need your woman to say to you, you're a bad boy. <laughs> you is a bad boy. Can't nobody else have done that like you. Oh, babe, I just barbecued. Mm-mm. No, ain't nobody's barbecue like your barbecue. So he don't want to hear it right. He said, oh, I just barbecue. Say that again. Say that, say that one more time. Listen, that barbecue you made, it be done, but it don't be dry. And your sauce, you put just enough sauce on it that it's not smothered with too much taste. And for me, you know I love the wings without sauce. So you left me a few wings. All them people was coming to our house. But you left me a few wings without sauce so I could dunk it myself. 
You overcooked a couple of them. So then wings on the end, them little bitty pieces, they were burnt. Because you know I like to bite through the bones of that wing. Then you knew Uncle, Uncle Harold was coming. So you set my wings aside. You put them in a special place in the oven. You shaped that foil in a heart shape around my wings. So nobody could tell what it was. They knew it was special because that foil, you took the time to shape it like a heart. You be like, girl, what time is company coming? They'll be here in 15 minutes. You say, we got time. <laughs> okay, I'm going to get done. I'm over my time. <laughs> Again. <sighs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> this family model is, is really important. So, okay, my wife said part three, Josh said part three, so I'll do it next Sunday. <laughs> Listen to me, people. You are so much bigger than what you've experienced. And, and, and I know, I know when you're leading your family, there are other families next door to you. There are other kids. Other people have jobs. Other people have gyms. Other people are doing stuff. But there just comes a time in your life, you got to make what you're doing important. And listen to me, everyone's not going to be happy. I get it. But that's not really the point. The point is, everyone, be, everyone around you will become happier when you're happy. Everyone. And there's somebody looking for you. Now, now, what happens usually in church is that people walk down the hallway and they pick somebody that they want to be like. And they say, will you be my financial mentor? Don't do that. Don't ask nobody in church. Don't, I mean, don't, 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 don't do that in here. I mean, there may be people, you may be all... In relationship with them. You know what I'm saying? Don't worry about it. Let me make you a promise. Can I make you a promise? Every one of these people that you need in your life, they're somewhere around you right now. God will not lie to you. He won't set you up for failure. They're in your life or close to your life right now. You just haven't recognize them but there are people there are people who are waiting to help you and they want to help you you just have to realize that they are help they're not your enemy they're not criticizing you they're your help Somebody has to push you to one more push up. Somebody has to push you to save one more dollar. Somebody has to push you if it's possible and send you home to your family. Somebody has to tell you you're bigger than that penny any job you're working. It has no purpose in it for you. It's not the money. 
It's not the money. It's not wrapped in purpose. And these people are not pushing you over the edge. They're just trying to get you ready for it. I go places all the time and I wonder how I got here. Give me 60 seconds to tell you this. A couple weeks ago, I didn't even really know what to say to you about it. It wasn't a social media thing. But Pastor Nell and I were paid to go to a city in Mississippi. And in three days, we met with the mayor, city council. Uh, we met with um, the Chamber of Commerce, the, 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 the advisors of the city, real estate agents, all the top folks. We're there, and they're saying, tell us what you did in Omaha. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Well, what happened with the flatbed at 42nd and Ames? They had studied us. They said, we know what you did with a few people in Omaha. Can you help us do that in this city? Can you help us train people? We know it was in church, but it sounds like you were doing stuff outside of church. You bought a Walmart? How'd you buy a Walmart? What about this $200,000 that came in the wire? They knew me. Linnell and I are sitting there like, what is going on? We've been invited to three different cities since to advise them on how to turn their cities around. Listen, hold up, hold up. A billionaire investor, we're sitting with him and, he, and, and her, and she says, do you want to buy this plantation? It's a bed and breakfast. She says, do, would you like to have it? I said, that's what I did. I went, and the Holy Spirit said, don't say anything. So I didn't answer her. She said, my time is about out. I need someone like you to take it over. My children don't want it. I'm like, this thing is worth six, seven million dollars. She says, They're not, they don't want it, but they wouldn't know what to do with it like you would. She said, she said, you would come back to Mississippi and make it a place for everybody. She says, there's no prejudice in you. I said, you can feel that? She said, I can feel it. That night, we're in the home of the, the director of the movie, The Help. We're in, we're in his $10 million house. He says, we're getting ready to produce a movie. Sorry, don't mean to offend anybody. But the name of the movie is Coffee Makes You Black. And the lady in the help, forget her name now, Octavia. Octavia, uh, the girl from here, Gabrielle Union, are stars in the movie. He says, here's your pass. Bring your family back and you get to stay in the house with Gabrielle and Octavia. They need to meet you. Listen to me. I thank God for Dr. Monroe who kicked my butt. He got me ready to be in the big rooms. In my head, in my head, when he says, do you have any actors at your church? You have any, you have any motion picture people at your church? They're asking me. And I'm trying to think of people that I could plug in. And in my head, I'm, go, I'm like, well, she, he's no longer with me. She, she's not attentive. Her eyes are someplace else. Her eyes aren't even here anymore. And in my head, I'm like, God, that's how you do it. As you're preparing me, you're preparing those who are around me for next levels. And they miss it all the time. Thank you so much for tuning into this week's message. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. If you are interested in not missing any other videos that we upload, make sure to click the subscribe button down below. Also, if this message has impacted you in such a way, you can also click the link down below to donate and to give to our ministries here at Ambassadors Worship Center. Anyway, thank you so much and we'll see you next week.